Today I wanted to deal with a couple of different subjects, all pretty much relating to the same thing, and I wanted to try and get through them as quickly as possible. So the main things I'm going to cover is I'm going to introduce you to the main players at the top rung of the pyramid. The way I see it, this pyramid has got probably at least five rungs to it and only the bottom rung of the pyramid I would say is completely naive to what is going on with the rest of uh, the members. Um, going to look at my dick of the year removal, what happened with that today. Uh, Pete Evans latest, uh, yes he's uh, hit the headlines again and just how to check names and dates of births on people, their directorship and shareholding associations are actually listed. Uh, so any record that's at ATSIC, I'll show you how to get to that. Uh, I'm bringing this up because um, when I was looking at associations uh, on this page, I noticed a discrepancy with um, birth certificates uh, dates. And a lot of them, they, there was what to me appeared to be a deliberate error of one day. Now, uh, it's not something that I've actually thought of to look at until I've come across it and the questions have been raised because we also know that uh, sovereignty extremists uh, have this way of describing the birth certificate as a, uh, a corporate asset that you're owned and you know, you're not a free person because you've got a birth certificate. And there is a fair amount of contempt for that in that it would not be a stretch of the imagination to actually believe that these people would uh, falsify birth dates because they do not deem it significant and that they're not owned by that date of birth or anything like that. In fact, there's a rather interesting date listed for an Adrian Brannock, the 31st of December, 1599. Now, that is a clear and deliberate uh, wrong birth date, unless he's claiming he's over how many hundreds of years old? <laughs> anyway, so that's basically what I'm going to cover in this video. And I just wanted to say thank you to everybody in the community that's been reaching out and uh, adding their bit of information and helping to understand a lot more of the complexities because it is a very complex situation. Each one of these people on this page has got uh, business associations and tie-ins and they're all doing their own little thing to keep their activities uh, discreet, shall we say. That's another word for saying don't want people to see what they're doing. <laughs> discreet. Yes. So, we will get straight in to the main players. Now we know from the planet uh, documentation that uh, there are all these particular other landowners that are involved in the development and they also have shares in companies that are linked back to the community as well. I mean, a lot of them have got fingers in a lot of pies. So what I'm going to do, let's look at Adrian Brennock because I'm going to tell you something here that I haven't mentioned before because I'd like to keep uh, things current, or well, not current, but give you more information, not repeat the same things. So this relates to uh, back in sep September 2016. Now Adrian Brannock is uh, in the Bulla Bulla community, Mount Warning Eco Village. Uh, it's got many names, it's all the same thing, but um, at the time that things are starting to, people are starting to ask questions, what's going on, this, that and the other, Adrian Brannock has got something else going on in the courts and it was before Justice Jackson in the Supreme Court of Queensland on the 6th of September 2015. Now 
The basis of this judgment that I'm about to read out was a claim and statement of claim filed the 30th of September 2015. So again, this is back when he's also starting up the community. But this isn't actually to do with the community, as I will explain. This judgment that was made in September 2016 was from a claim made in September the previous year by Perpetual Trustee Company Limited against Adrian Peter Brennock and Christiane Brennock. Now there's a little bit of a story behind this and I will tell you that very briefly. Now the information I'm about to say has not been confirmed so um, this is something that I am yet to confirm that it's been told to me that uh, Adrian Brennock was a mortgage broker. I have not been able to find any confirmation of that as yet but uh, that is what I've been told. So before any of this went on, he was a mortgage broker. He was involved with Freedom Summits. The tax office is wanting to come against him and is coming against him. It actually took them four years to complete uh, taking him to court and making him bankrupt. So ultimately, all of this, these things are pretty much happening at the same time. But uh, this uh, perpetual trustees company was essentially for a property at uh, 36 Saltwater Terrace, Helensvale in Queensland. He bought this house by borrowing the money of um, Perpetual Trustee Company uh, and then decided that he would try and set up a sovereignty claim and not pay for it. When that didn't work, a Perpetual Trustees came against him, sued him and uh, this is the result of what that judgment was in court that day. Right, by consent of the judgment of the court is that 1. Judgment for the plaintiff as against the first defendant and the second defendant, which is Adrian and Christy Brennock, in the amount of 1 million and $92,539.31. So that just said that Perpetual Trustees is owed the money by Christy and Adrian Brennock and that's the amount of money they owe, over a million dollars. Two, judgment for the plaintiff as against the first defendant for recovery of possession of the land contained in the title reference 5001314 being lot 98 on registered plan 860201 County of Ward, Parish of Coomera and located at 36 Saltwater Terrace, Helensvale in the state of Queensland with all appurtenances there too. Three, the first defendant's counterclaim is dismissed. The second defendant's counterclaim is dismissed. This was their claims um, of, you know, we don't owe it because we're claiming sovereignty and all that other stuff. Alright, so uh, five, the defendants pay the plaintiff first defendant by first counterclaim first defendant by second counterclaim and the second defendant by f yeah that's that's pretty much all the people um, have, that they've got to pay the cost for I'm not going to double dutch that one and number six the defendants pay the costs of the third defendant by first counterclaim blah 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 so that's ultimately the judgment of the court that was ruled on the 6th of September 2016 that Adrian Brannock and his wife uh, give up that property they owed a million and what was it 92,539.51 so if uh, that property was seized and was unable to be sold for that amount they'd owe the uh, difference 
So that was just going on at the time he's trying to uh, set up the community. He's taking in monies and monies that uh, when you access the uh, statement of the Rothwall Trust account and you look at it and you ask where are a lot of these monies coming and going from, there is a lot of unanswered questions and well too that people in the community uh, complained of non-transparency. Not only non-transparency but any records they would have got make as much sense as what a, a kindergartner who doesn't know how to add yet or doesn't even know that putting down you know Bugs Bunny as a character is acceptable bookkeeping. And I'm saying Bugs Bunny as an example that false names have been used, people that don't exist. But anyway, that's for another video. Let's have a look at the main players. So the next two in here are Dean Rodimer and Mark Cora. They're bringing in the sovereignty tribal aspect. Uh, I'm not going to get too much into that. Needless to say, though, that, that they are representing Minjimbul on Bunjalung land without authority and respect to the elders of that land. And then we've got Mark McMurtry, a.k.a. Gunnam Buddy Jakamara, and um, a.k.a. Benyini Nyanyini, uh, another name for the Mount Burrell Fruit and Veggie Shop, is a Thorowall elder. So you've got three different elders representing on Bunjalung land. That's quite an interesting thing, but that is also for another video. Uh, because uh, all of these, except for Dean Rodimer and Mark Cora, who are the two official representative and signatory holders for the um, Nightcap on Minjimbal Tribal Discretionary Trust. So pretty much you invest in this community. These two are the holders of the, the trust that um, tie into all your entitlements. Now here we've got... Um, Peter Van Leishout. Uh he's an associated property owner and also uh, he's got shareholdings in associated companies to do with Nightcap as well. And he was one of the original instigators of the DA that they may try to use all those years back. Six years ago it lapsed, but when it was actually approved, it was approved when his wife was Lord Mayor of the Tweed Council. But even though he got it through, nothing was done in stage one and the approval lapsed. So, you know, it wasn't like they didn't have their chance, it got blown. Now we've got uh, Derek Zillman here. He's mentioned in the judgment uh, going back looking at that in association with um, Zimmerland. Uh, it's yet to confirm it, but uh, Peter Van Leishout is actually in charge of that. But Derek Zillman has had a long association with that. His current company is Capital Z, um, which is basically a front page, web page. You click on it, contact. He got, uh, he's got uh, pretty much, uh, he's organising financing and things like that. Because you could not get uh, financing through legit legitimate means, vendor financing is offered. And some of these people would be in charge of organising that. And I dare say that is uh, Derek Zillman's, one of his areas of expertise with his capital Z company. Then we've got uh, Dolph Cook. Now, Dov Cook is interesting in the fact that he is part of the um, landowners involved with the major development. He knows what they're doing, uh, doesn't approve of it from what I can tell, but still is just sitting in there, not doing much. He's doing his biochar and everything, you know, he's got his own stuff going on. I don't think he pays that much attention. Uh, I won't go into other things I've heard anyway, but then we've got Philip Dixon. Now Philip Dixon is one of these quiet achievers. 
He's um, a member. He's also a landowner, as stated, through um, company associations. He is uh, director of the Mount Burrell Commercial, along with uh, Cherie Stokes, who is uh, secretary. And just before, well, there's interesting things that have gone on with the Mount Burrell Commercial. You'll actually find that through um, associated member companies, they pretty much own all the shares of Mount Burrell Commercial. Uh, Michaela Lowe here is listed as having 200 shares. Uh, uh, Moat Investments for Richard Moat. Uh, Philip Dixon has also got his own shares listed as well as the majority of shares being held as 1,200 shares by a member company called, uh, hang on, just let me check that, uh, Yadaki Capital. Uh, that, and Rainmaker uh, Eco, uh, something or other. Anyway, this is not a, an informative about the complete correct names of the companies. I'm just trying to show you that they they've all got a finger in their these companies, and uh, a lot of these companies just exist in title uh, only. There's no asset no product, no nothing, it's just for moving money backwards and forwards. Um, and a lot of it is just done on books by people like Roth Wall who keep very bad accounting records of trust account monies. So this layer up here, this rung of, of players is pretty much, oh and Darko Kovac all I've been able to find out about Darko Kovac, and that was searching in the um, names register for uh, directorship and shareholding associations, is that he's Serbian. I cannot find any more distinct information on him. So they're your main players. They all know what's going on. They work in well together. Now. All of these ones on here, oh, except for, uh, we won't put this last little guy down here, is Stephen Neville Starts of the uh, Liquidators for Wollumbin Horizons. I've put him down here just to bring a face to uh, what I'm going to say a little bit further on. So, um, Rothwell Wall, a uh, lawyer, taking in the trust account monies and funds, uh, very bad at bookkeeping too. Richard Moat, uh, he's been involved right from the word go. As far as I can tell, he's got uh, so many dealings going on. I've seen affidavits where people have said they've paid money directly into his bank account and it's gone missing. He runs a uh, Nightcap uh, Realty and he is currently still promoting and selling 440 existing lots with pre-approval, which doesn't exist. Then we've got uh, Michaela Pedersen, or Pedersen, now low. Pedersen was her um, maiden name. Michaela Linnell, or however she wants to pronounce it. Uh, she is the one that responds back when you send in your first inquiry to Nightcap. She sends you off an email and then sends you on to Rich Mode who gives you more information. Uh, don't know why because uh, she's actually she's actually um, more she's got her own uh, real estate business herself, Ren Realty, and her husband Imon Lowe, is major salesman and uses that business to you know conduct all businesses and everything so I don't know why she would pass it on to him maybe because he's the main promoter and that way they can keep track of all the people because they all end up at one source so Imon Lowe yes well we've talked about him before uh, it was mentioned the other day that several months ago he appeared in Southport Court allegedly for trying to sell a gun 
to an undercover police officer. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I, that, uh, that's not confirmed. I would not know. That's why I stated, I yeah. Most of these things I can tell you uh, one way or the other or they are unconfirmed or unknown. Now we've got Tyler, oh, hang on, before we get on to the next one, we've got Cherie Stokes and Martin Madron. Now they are very much involved in the bookkeeping side of it. Uh, Cherie Stokes, as I said, is secretary to the um, Mount Burrell Commercial, which uh, Philip Dixon is director of. So, and Cherie Stokes has been, and Martin Madron, have been very heavily involved behind the scenes in the bookkeeping side. They've never had much of a public face. Uh, maybe that's why I can't find photos of them. But I will endeavour to put a face to these names so that you can see they are real people. All right, this is um, Tyler Tolman down here. Now, down here amongst these, I would call them pretty much Oh, except for this guy on the end. That's uh, been our panel. A lot of uh, locals probably already know him. I've called him Jeffrey Pownall. That's It's actually Gregory Pownall. That's his real name. He's trading as Binar Pownall. Uh, he was the one that uh, wrote out the protocols that uh, for the base community guidelines. So he's just there. He, he doesn't seem to do too much even though he's a member. Uh, I don't know how much he promotes it locally. Locals would probably be able to inform me. So yes, we've got uh, Tyler Tolman, who's got his uh, nice little retreat operating out of Bali. His father, Don Tolman. Uh, Pete Evans, who, by confirmation of Richard Mote and uh, Adrian Brennock as well, through... Uh, contacting them as a potential investor and being informed of what's going on inside the community. Pete Evans was confirmed as a member, as also was Max Egan, who was gifted his share by one of the developers. And uh, yes, as I've said, we've already mentioned Binner. And down the end here, yes, I've put the face of um, Steve Starts on here because uh, he's been brought into, um, well, pretty much allegations have been made against him and his associations in knowing what's been going on and helping people to achieve outcomes that really he shouldn't be doing. So I'm questioning, are they actually true? And I'm not going to go too much further into that because... Uh, people do need the opportunity to answer for themselves as like I've given most of these people an opportunity to speak for themselves and uh, they choose not to but there are some that have legal obligations like this guy at the end and some others that are not mentioned here that uh, it is on them now that if they do not follow through with um, what they've been informed on they will actually be held accountable for not informing the proper authorities. So um, that's just on that one. Now this representation of the main players pretty much, uh, whilst not all inclusive, uh, covers the top one, two, three rungs of the pyramid. You know, that pyramid of power that uh, we live with in society that we're supposed to escape the matrix from? Well, there's a pyramid of power and structure within this nightcap on Minjimbal community as well. So represented the, in front of you are two, two to three rungs that are all knowing what's going on and involved at various levels. Uh, you've then got the fourth rung underneath, which is... Pretty much, you know, just your average investor, but they also know what's going on and don't care. Then you've got uh, your innocent investors at the bottom rung of the scale. And when I'm talking about the, the fourth rung investors that are in on it, uh, they can kind of be like the equivalent of your thugs that go out and, you know, carry out the dirty work. 
And uh, yes, anyway, we'll move on to the bottom rung of the scale, the, f the fifth rung where most of us actually <laughs> live in real life. Um, are fairly naive to what's going on and fairly innocent to wanting what was advertised, not what's actually going on. Because there's a lot going on up the top end of the uh, pyramid that people down the bottom uh, have just got no idea of. As I said, all the rest of them have got varying levels of understanding in what is going on. And a lot of them know exactly what's going on. And uh, they've been uh, lining their pockets with it. So, change of subject now. Well, different subject. Uh, it was brought to my attention earlier today that uh, my Dick of the Year award is gone. And it's like, what? I bought up first this page and it's like, no, it's public no restrictions and as you can see it still shows up on my dash dick of the i can't put it on there it gets rid of it but dick of the year award adrian brannock and yet you go over here and it's gone now thank you very much because this is what i got sent of what you can see from that video the con this content is not available on this country domain due to a defamation complaint. And I looked at that and I thought, are you kidding me? If anyone would have complained, it would have been me. <laughs> this was actually something that was directed and said at me. So what was the defamation complaint? But anyway, rather than deal with, um, well can't deal with that. The only way that I could even, well, the only reason I even know why it's disappeared is because I was sent that image. Other than that, I wouldn't know. It, even, it is even showing up here that it is public and no restrictions. So I don't know what's going on on that side of it, but there we go. It's up again. <laughs> You know, you, you just can't. Uh, I mean, seriously, as I said, if anyone was going to make a defamation complaint, it would actually be me. Can YouTube seriously just go, oh. But, you know, my son just informed me that um, people that know exactly how to word complaints so that the bot that picks up these complaints will automatically associate it and get rid of it, these people are well versed in it. I mean, you got to look at it. It is pretty damning for being called Dick of the Year, isn't it? I mean, I gave myself Dick of the Week award, I gave the Tasmanian Police, and I even gave Gunham, you know, the, the, the Dick of the Week award. Well, we all took it, but not little sooky pussy Adrian Brennock because he's got so much to hide. So much. Isn't that a bit cheeky to actually say defamation? What, against him? Oh, seriously, that could even be looking at dick of the decade. <laughs> or did I get defamation because I called him dick of the year? It's a joke. It's always been in, in the context of a joke, my very first introduction. I've also awarded myself Dick of the Week Award. You know, we all do stupid things. So that's uh, Mr. Adrian Brannock getting, uh, making a complaint, wording his complaint so that the YouTube bot will take down for a defamation case. I guarantee you put something in there like, oh, there's Supreme Court injunctions that this isn't allowed to be said. Oh, I'm a sooky little yap yap. You know, it's like, oh, you dear little princess. You can shoot your mouth off and slander anybody else you want, but anyone dare try and speak the truth about you and you get slapped with all this bullshit. So there we go, little princess, dick of the year, Adrian Brennock. You get it back up there again. 
put it on other channels too and I'll just keep putting it up there because you've got no legitimate claim of defamation and besides that I think I've given you and your lawyers and your liquidator and your bankruptcy administrator more to think about than me yeah real problems eh? as I say you've got to be seen to be doing the right thing and having people uh, given the opportunity to do the right thing before you turn around and make an allegation to the cops because you know you go to them and they say well did you approach them and of course if you say no they say go away and um, if you have no luck come back then so to avoid that issue they're all given the opportunity to do the right thing so that when I do take it to that one step further and they say did you approach them it's like oh did I ever would you like to see all their different answers and all their different responses over all the period of time that I attempted to get these people to take it seriously so yes indeed I did first raise it with them I did give them the opportunity to remedy it and they refused to and that's why I'm here so that's my uh, little one on that. Let's move on to Pete Evans. Now the same person that sent me uh, the image of my video being uh, blocked also sent me a link to something very interesting. This one here. It's from the Daily Mail Co in the UK and it's dated the 26th of October 2020 so this is what four days ago Pete Evans says he lost over a million dollars with his venture the paleo way and confirms their health program which cost users $99 each to access has now finished Wow so another failed enterprise he seems to be hitching his wagon to all the wrong things doesn't he but then any anyway that's his problem Pete Evans has actually been informed of the activities that has been going on at the nightcap on Minjimbal and by uh, people that he doesn't know and by friends that he should trust and he has refused to listen to any of that so ultimately he has to take responsibility for the fact that well Pete Evans healthy everyday pets is that what your food's good for <laughs> nightcap on Mingible promoting it even has its own page he is a member he's promoting it and the word on the Bush Telegraph tells me that the uh, Sphinx Rock Cafe is going to reopen with Pete Evans in charge of it. Unconfirmed, do not know this. So, of course, being about uh, Pete Evans, uh, I don't know why he's so famous. I'd never heard of him until all of this, but they produce a lot of information on what he's up to simply because there are people that want to know what he's doing so all these links are about the same thing Pete Evans lost more than a million dollars because users were going to the paleo way and started complaining to him on Facebook you know why can't I access it and uh, he starts telling people that uh, well, you know, bummer, it's gone belly up. <laughs> Again, something has gone belly up that he's been involved with. So there's uh, a lot of activity going on around Pete Evans again because of his failed The Paleo Way venture. And it's cost him over a million dollars. Well, how many users... Uh, at $99 each have lost as well I mean this is all about poor Pete and what he's lost what about what other people have lost this is just so typical you know that 
uh, you, you're looking at what Pete lost. The culminated loss of the potential users may be way more than what Pete Evans has lost out of it and what he actually made out of it until he lost out of it, supposedly. Because how does one lose out of these things? Was it built on fresh air in the first place? Who knows? I don't know. I never really looked into the paleo way. As soon as I saw paleo, I thought caveman. <laughs> and it looks like his paleo way venture has gone the way of the caveman too. So this is his paleo way is no longer available. That image is shown in you know, a lot of these articles. Look at this woman looking up here at him like, oh, my hero. It's like, woman, you know how to cook better than what he does. I guarantee you, you've cooked for a whole tribe. He just cooks for a camera. And, and look at what he starts his food off with, a representation. Healthy everyday pets. I mean, what, has he gone to veterinary services? Is uh, human grade pet and, you know, dog and cat food his uh, standard? Well, I'd have to tell you that if his paleo way is anything like the uh, way that I've tasted of international chefs that have come from that area, the dog wouldn't even eat it. Ooh, yeah, maybe that's why it does end up as pet food because people don't actually want to eat the bland, disgusting boot leather. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> Let's get on to the next part. So this next part is pretty much following um, unsubstantiated information at this stage. It's like all information that you start off with. You start checking out if it has any validity. So from a comment that I saw was that uh, Pete Evans was um, involved with the Mount Warning Forest Hideaway retreat and that uh, he was going to set it up as a yoga retreat. So, of course, I start to check these things out. We do find that there is such a business. We have a look at it. It's a beautiful place. So um, you understand that this is a business retreat. It offers accommodation rates. It's, it's a business. And because it conducts business, one would expect that there would be some kind of council approval for that business activity there. Uh, so I did check it out as a natural course of, I check out the validity of everything, what goes on with them. 460 Birrell Creek Road via Ukai. So we go and we do a property search on that address, comes up here. The interesting thing is if you type that property address into Google Earth and click find, it will come up with um, hidden retreat or something, not the actual property address. So it's actually known as a hidden retreat. And, oh yes. So that's the actual property in question. That's where um, it's located. And the thing is that if you actually look on here, that's all green in here. But looking at the current image on Google Earth, that is all bared up. There's a lot of earthworks going on and everything there. I don't know what that's for. But uh, I would say that they're expanding the retreat to take in for more business. Just a guess. And uh, yes, I could bring Google up uh, Earth up right now and show you, but you can just as easily type in that address and see the current visual that it's bringing up that that area there is um, there's earthworks going on for some reason they're clearing it don't know why as I said one can only surmise so in looking at this particular uh, business that is supposedly associated with Pete Evans and does he own it so the first place I go to is the ABN lookup and I search for that particular name. It comes up with three different active ABNs and 
for all intensive purposes, they appear to be exactly the same. So we look at those three ABNs and we come up with Peter E and Maxine N Ridgeway as a family partnership for the Forest Hideaway. It's still active and it's been called the Forest Hideaway since July 2012. Now the other entry associated with it is uh, with Leisha Gay Irene Hinch, uh, trading name Leisha Shu, and if you look at the Mount Warning Forest Hideaway, that's been from the 5th of April 2018. Oh, it's expired. Hang on. Okay, so if you click on that link and bring up the ATSIC record, it actually shows that the principal place of business is 460 Birrell Creek Road, Birrell Creek. So this is confirming that this person is most definitely at that retreat. And it's actually quite uh, peculiar that they can all carry on with pretty much the same name and not be in conflict because you have to have a different name. You cannot have identical names. But anyway, so the third entry is for uh, Jadwiga Edwina Lisa Kowoski, Kowaska. Uh, also, Mount Warning Forest Hideaway Retreat. We'll click on that because that record would have expired again. And again, it's got 460 Beryl Creek Road, Beryl Creek. So those two are most definitely associated with it. And the other one, that uh, this one here, the third one, that was uh, that has been associated with it for a fair longer time than what it has. But also seeing here that in November 2018, there's a change of addresses where perhaps these people moved to Queensland away from the retreat itself. Um, and who is Peter E. And in this, I have wondered for many um, hmm, days now whether Peter Evans is actually like, you know, his first and middle name and he doesn't use his last name to protect his um, privacy. So in wondering that, is it possible that because it is known to the locals that uh, Peter Evans is, is, uh, has bought the Mount Warning uh, Forest Hideaway Retreat. Now there is no transactions of sales as far as that retreat that's going on but there are three distinct ABNs associated with it. In what appears that there would be three separate ABNs controlling that one business entity. This is an, um, an educated guess, if you could say, rather than confirmed fact. Something that I'd have to do a little bit more investigation into actually know about. So if that is the case, that it is known that he's in associated with it, these other two ABNs are definitely confirmed associated with it. This third one, is this the one that Pete Evans is associated with, this Peter E and Maxine N Ridgeway? As I say, again, this is something that I would have to investigate more and find out. Right, now this uh, next part is a rather interesting, well, for me, oh, I'd have to bring up a record that doesn't have one, wouldn't I? Let's go to this one. No, that one doesn't work. Hang on. Okay, this is uh, at six website where you can easily check these companies out. You can see the last three documents lodged publicly. And then there's these list of information brokers. Now, I used to work at uh, Dun & Bradstreet and I actually wondered where are they listed on here now? They're not listed on here. Well, they're actually Ilion. And I checked out all these information providers to see what you can access through them. Now here's a very interesting thing that you come across. 
you can access different things. This is a company business name search where you can check out the information on a particular business and order a report. I'll tell you what, they're pretty exy prices too that um, I could give you a report for a lot cheaper than that. $396. But uh, you follow the links, as I did, and you end up with all these other different things. You see up here, you've got reports, company business, uh, personal name, document search. This document search here, you can put in the, AB, uh, the ACN number and it will bring up all documents that have been lodged against that company. If you want to see what those documents are, you pay for that extract. But you can actually see all the documents lodged, not just the three that are recorded on the ATSIC website, but the whole lot. So yes, I did actually have a look up here, Peter Ridgeway, to see if Peter Ridgeway Evan, uh, that's his middle name, existed as a person here. And this is what you basically get when you search a name on the personal name search. Now, these names here are all associated with ATSIC records. So you're going to be getting something that is associated with holdings at ATSIC. It is uh, specific to company and shareholdings in that respect. So if you click on uh, like Adrian Brennock here, it comes up with two Adrian Brennocks. That is actually his real date of birth there. Uh, these records also apply to him as well as these ones. These actually would be showing that uh, a date of birth has to be listed where you are a director or secretary of a company. If you are a shareholder of the company, you do not have to list your date of birth. Uh, well, it's not publicly, publicly given, put it that way. So all of these entries that actually don't have a date of birth, one may assume, but would need to find out, that these would actually represent shareholdings. The ones with date of births represent directorships or secretaryships. Now, if you notice here, the very interesting thing about Adrian Brennock is 31st of December, 1599. Now that is clearly a false date. I mean, it could be someone completely different other than the Adrian Brennock that we all know. Uh, but uh, it's uh, not a very big chance of that. Considering, too, uh, that, as I've mentioned before, about the claim of the birth certificate being a <laughs> virtually a corporate asset, they think it is, that holds ownership over each and every individual's and we are traded as and made money out of through that birth certificate. There is a lot of contempt for the birth certificate itself, so it's not surprising that someone like Adrian Brennock would put in, you know, the end of the year. I mean, did he actually mean to put 1599, or was he meaning to put in the last day of the last month of the last year of the century. Was he meaning to put in 1999? Don't know. But uh, I've bought this up and you can access it very easily by clicking as I did and go in and search anyone to see if they've got any associations. All the main players that I've introduced you to, I've already done this for. And this is where I've bought up uh, the discrepancies in the birth certificates because uh, whilst you've got correct dates here there are many others where there is a day difference and it is consistent over at least five or six of those involved in the top rung of the pyramid where they have made what I would dare say they claim to be mistakes in their birth certificate assuming that that mistake in the birth certificate then means that they are not held accountable for that because they are not that person, they weren't born on that day. 
but if you actually deliberately give out false information, yes, that does make you accountable. So that was the final uh, bit of information I wanted to show you how you can access. You can go in here and, um, as I said, you can type in uh, document searches. Uh, just hold on, I'll bring one up for you. Okay, so what we've got here is actually the Mount Burrell Commercial Proprietary Limited, which is controlling the Mount Burrell Business District. Now, um, I'm not going to go into the ownership right there, but what I want to uh, show you is that these are all the documents that have been lodged from when it was first registered as a company right up until the last document that has been lodged in April 2020. Now the reason I'm bringing this up, and it also shows you there's 42 documents. You can see what each of these documents are. Now if you wanted to, you can click on these and purchase the details of it. Most of these are just standard stuff that you wouldn't want to look at. Only when there's change in share distribution and member holdings that you would actually want to look at it. But the thing I wanted to draw attention to here is that Mount Burrell is actually uh, Mount Burrell Commercial. Had a receiver manager appointed, then it looked like it was ceased. But then another document came through which actually cancelled the uh, end of the receiver manager. So what we've got here is a notice of cancellation or revocation of a lodged document cancels this document number here, which is this one here, which was where it was first thought that Mount Burrell Commercial went into a small period of receivership and then it ended, but it didn't. This document here cancels that one and this end of administration return here is the return of the receiver manager. This document shows that on the 31st of March they received and lodged this document, it was processed on that day and effective from the 4th of May that it was the return of the receiver and manager. As I've shown that the previous cessation, oh, sorry, wrong one, cease to act was revoked by this. So now as you proceed to go through and look at all the documents that have been lodged since, none of them have been revoking the appointment of the receiver manager. So ultimately, to this day, Mount Burrell Commercial is trading, or well, attempting to trade out of receivership under a receiver manager. Now it would be interesting to know who is that receiver manager. Is it the same people that are dealing with the liquidation of Wollumbin Horizons? Is it the same person dealing with it? It would be interesting, as I said, to know who the receiver manager was for Mount Burrell Commercial. Now if you look at the condition of the Mount Burrell Commercial business district, uh, it's not in very good condition as locals would tell you. The caravan park is neglected and run down. There's no one in the fruit and veg shop. The uh, Sphinx Rock Cafe, well, they walked away from a thriving business. It's now a, a real estate booth that uh, allegedly that Pete Evans is now going to t turn into his own little restaurant or whatever. And the general store is uh, having problems with equipment not working properly and not getting things tended to. So ultimately the questions are, um, if there is a receiver manager still managing the affairs of Mount Burrell Commercial, uh, why is 
well, the tenants of the places involved with uh, leasing off Mount Burrow Commercial should be dealing with the receiver managers. When receiver managers are appointed, that is external administration. Someone takes over charge of the books because you couldn't do it and they're going to try and help you trade out. So you've got account supervision. Now, Mount Burrow Commercial, Director Phil Dixon and Secretary Cherie Stokes would have su supervision from the receiver manager. So who is the receiver manager and why has the condition of the commercial a um, aspect been allowed to deteriorate through the actions of the members? Anyway, I'm going to leave it at that today. I think I've covered enough uh, areas, given an update. I do have other updates, but that can be another video. And that is pretty much it for now. I'll catch you next time.